So we're in Brantford today and it is honestly one of my favorite cities ever to invest in. Now we're in Brantford with Sarah Eder and she's going to show us around one of her current buy and hold burr properties here in Brantford, Ontario. Houses like this are typically like in the 250 to 260 range. We negotiated it for $210,000. This is a legal fourplex non-conforming five. It was retrofitted in 1994. This main level was broken up into two oh, okay. units. We are actually actually doing something which you might sound crazy to most people and we're actually reducing it down to a fourplex. Sure, some of the more astute uh, listeners heard 100% loan to value with your private financing. Yeah. One, is that even possible? And two, if so, how, how does that work? What is up YouTube? Matt McKeever here and we've got another amazing compilation video. Today's video is with Sarah Edder. If you don't remember Sarah Edder, we met up with her in Brantford, Ontario, and she showed us around a couple of her project properties. We checked out some single families, some small multifamilies, and it was just a lot of fun getting a better understanding and perspective of the Brantford, Ontario market. So if you guys are enjoying these compilation videos, one, smash the like button, two, jump in the comment section and let me know who else should I make a compilation video with, and otherwise, let's just jump into some great Canadian real estate content. All right, now we're in Brantford with Sarah Edder, and she's going to show us around one of her current buy and hold burr properties here in Brantford, Ontario. I'm really excited to check it out. Thank you, Sarah, for taking the time to meet up. Absolutely. Thanks, guys, for coming to tour my nice little single family burr. So this project uh, we actually acquired in May. A uh, little bit of a long uh, story because it is a private deal. So we had some issues with the sellers. We're just getting underway with renovations now. We should be done in a few weeks. So we're going to show you guys kind of halfway through the renovation process. Awesome, let's check it out. Let's come inside. All right. So this is kind of like your standard Brantford property. It's just like a big two-story brick Victorian. Um, it was actually built, I think, in 1920. So uh, it needed a good amount of work, uh, a little bit more, unfortunately, than we were hoping for. We were budgeting about 25 to 30,000. Of course, when you get into these old houses, you start to experience some real stuff. So I was telling you guys about a story about the electrical in this wall. We had some live wiring that was happening, ended up having to call an electrician and spent a lot more than we were hoping for. We we're gonna keep some of the existing cabinets in the kitchen, just decide to gut everything and do all new tile. We think it's definitely gonna pay off in the long run, but we'll show you guys around and kind of the process where we're at right now. So we're about two to three weeks away from being completed. So you can see most of like the electrical is behind the walls, you can't tell, but it's already been um, updated. All of this used to be plaster. So there's some old like brick walls in behind here. Uh, this kitchen was very, very much a mess. Traditional like popcorn ceilings. Uh, we had just crazy like elevation stuff going on. There was plywood in behind the walls. So although we didn't want to spend this extra money, we actually ended up just gutting this entire space so it could just be a nice clean slate. I mean, most families like to spend their time in the kitchen. So we want to make sure this is like a bright, fresh space. So, um, we're going to be replacing um, these doors and kitchen cabinets and everything are gonna be installed in a couple of weeks. Brand new custom kitchen, we have all new appliances and it should be a really nice space. Um, you guys can probably see out in the backyard, looks like a very nice place for a family to spend time. Uh, we put actually a brand new fence surrounding the entire property. Again, that was an extra expenditure we were really not counting on, but we found out when we were going around the perimeter that this fence was actually like starting to cave in this way. So we decided that because this is going to be targeted towards families, we wanted to have a gate on the side and a full enclosed fenced area. We also put a new roof and some paint on that nice little shed out there. And this was actually all dirt. It was a really gross backyard. There was a lot of like detritus and like glass pieces. Like it was not a safe place for a family. So we decided to sod it um, and just make it more appealing for our, our renters when they come in essentially. So, all right, so we can go to the basement if you guys do want to do the basement. All right. It's actually kind of a neat space. Um, we're pretty lucky that it is like a full sized um, basement. And while a lot of people might actually 
um, not do anything with the basement, we wanted to provide extra value for our future tenants. So this is actually something kind of funny that I want to show you guys. So this is the previous owner. Um, you're probably wondering, where's all the electrical equipment and where's like the hot water tanks and everything? It is behind. All right, now it's the best time of the video. We're gonna be diving deep into the numbers. So Sarah's broken it all down for us. So walk us through, Sarah. What exactly did this look like? Um, so this is actually a private deal, uh, as you can see. So we got it with private financing. So we negotiated it for $210,000. Um, it was a private deal with some people that were going through a tough time, which is why we were able to negotiate like a really good deal on it. Mm -hmm. uh, houses like this are typically like in the 250 to 260 range. So we really got it significantly under. under yeah, market. you were saying it was kind of a hoarder house. There was a lot of stuff going on here. So Absolutely. a lot of other investors probably would have just looked past it and not seen the potential beneath all the stuff. Exactly, and apparently a couple of other investors had come through it and they were a little afraid because it's the type of deal I don't get to do a home inspection or really dig into it. We kind of took it on face value. So. Yeah, and so why is this private financing important? Um, so for us, we actually did attempt to go to the bank for a conventional mortgage. They saw the condition of the house and they wouldn't lend for the same reason that most investors overlooked it, they don't know it's underneath all that junk. So they actually gave us options. Um, we had a good broker, so she was still able to obtain private financing for us at good rates um, with the option to then refinance at the end into a conventional product. So Gotcha. So a lot of the investors that would be looking at this sort of property, if they're only going through a traditional bank, essentially like they're not part of the real buyer pool for this type of property. So a lot less competition kind of when dealing with properties that a bank won't finance. Yeah, absolutely. It takes a little more like risk. You know, we're 100% loan to value financing and everything. So definitely, you know, a little more of an advanced uh, strategy. So. Gotcha. And then, so you broke down for us the closing costs, which is great because sometimes on HGTV, they forget those. Yeah. So do you mind just for people that are maybe new to real estate investing, what kind of expenses are included in your closing costs? Yeah. So that's really important. I mean, especially in flips, people always forget about the holding costs and the closing costs. So that basically factored in, we did have to pay some lender fees uh, for that private right. financing. So that's one thing. It's like with not going with a bank, you're paying some broker and lender mm -hmm. fees. So it's a little more expensive. Um, that also included lawyers and um, the land transfer tax. Gotcha. And then so renovation budget, we're looking at approximately 50,000. Yeah. So do you mind breaking down for us just what's included in that 50,000? Yeah, absolutely. As you guys can tell, we're still kind of under renovation, yeah. which is why that's a 50. Uh, initially, it was supposed to actually be more of like a $30,000 budget. But as I was telling them earlier, we kind of ran into some hiccups, which you always will with houses like this. Mm -hmm. So in that 50,000 is a uh, paint, flooring, a totally brand new kitchen. It's completely gutted. Um, we did some waterproofing in the basement as well as an epoxy seal um, on okay. the concrete. We want to make it like a usable space. This is going to be a single family like home mm -hmm. uh, for somebody. Um, also a bit of like drywall, plaster work. We did a little bit of like tiling and uh, refurbishment um, to the bathrooms upstairs and downstairs as well as a bit of like paint and a couple windows that needed to be replaced and the sod in the back. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then, so what's your exact process for estimating renovations? How do you go about that? Do you have like a checklist? Or are you walking through with your contractor? Is it experience? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I'm fairly knowledgeable. I can usually eyeball pretty good what things are gonna cost, but I wanna be as accurate as possible. So I tend to bring my contractor with me through, like for a walkthrough, yeah. and then he's itemizing everything, and then I get a pretty good ballpark. Gotcha. And then, so we've got holding class costs of 9,000. Yes. So that's another thing is like with private financing, I mean, my holding costs are way higher than your typical hold. And that's because of the interest costs mm -hmm. on the mortgage essentially. So in those holding costs are the interest payments for the mortgage, um, our taxes, utilities, uh, water, and all that fun stuff. It did take a little longer than we were hoping. Um, cause it's been a little bit of a longer hold. So, um, it's about like three to four months worth of holding costs. Gotcha. 
Yeah. So all in, we're looking 275, and then so target refinance 320. 20. Yeah. This neighborhood is really cool because it's gentrifying. So when we first purchased this property in May, we were thinking that our target refinance was going to be about 285. So we okay. were trying to really like number crunch and keep our costs as low as possible. And then the market kind of experienced a bit of a surge in the late summer, and we actually, by the time we closed, even gained like more equity than we'd anticipated when we first bought the property in May. So now that that's happening, um, we're looking at easily 320. It could even be slightly higher. And so you had mentioned earlier that you were kind of debating whether this should be a flip or a buy and hold with a burr. So how do you make that decision? Um, for me, it comes down to effort and margins. So, I mean, I like to see a minimum of like $50,000 on a flip, okay. unless it's going to be a really fast 30 day in and out. I make 20 to 30,000 on that flip. I'll take the smaller uh, margin on it. Uh, but for me, once we kind of dug into this house a little bit, we thought, okay, there's a little more work here than your yeah. typical flip. Like if I'm going to put $50,000 of reno into a flip, I want to see at least that plus a percentage mm -hmm. return back to me. I knew it wasn't going to happen with this particular property, um, at least when we first purchased it. Mm -hmm. And this is the type of neighborhood where it's probably the last neighborhood to gentrify within Brantford and it was really hard. There weren't a lot of good finished comps. So for us, we were a little nervous about going the full flip route, um, but we might still maybe in a year or two. Okay. Yeah. And then so when you refinance, you'll be refinancing with like a traditional A lender or a bank? Correct. Yes. And that'll be 80% loan 80 to value? 80% loan to value, yeah. So then essentially once you're done, about nineteen, twenty thousand dollars all into the deal and you're left with any cash flow? There is a good amount of cash flow for this actually. For a lot of people that don't know about Brantford, even in this neighborhood, mm -hmm. a single family home like this with a full yard, three ba uh, three beds, two baths, goes for almost $2,000 a month plus utilities. Okay. So even at 320, we're doing some decent cash flow. So I think it's about $495 a month in you cash must. flow. And voila. There we go. Pretty good. So yeah, that's great cash flow. Thinking about like five hundred dollars a month for a property like this, the payback or your cash on cash returns pretty strong, all things considered. And then so you broke down for us the annual ROI as well. Did so factoring in the fact that we're only leaving like less than twenty thousand mm -hmm. in the property with some pretty strong cash flow in the single family and the appreciation that we're obviously experiencing in this gentrifying neighborhood, we're looking at about thirty two percent ROI annually. So that's why we actually ended up deciding to hold it because the numbers here are so strong. We think that in a couple years of holding, we're going to do much better for our dollar than just flipping it right away. Gotcha. And so is this like a typical example of what can be done in Brantford? Is this an exceptional deal? What's your opinion? Um, I would say it's on the road of exceptional. When I bought this, it was an okay deal. And now with the way the prices have surged, gotcha. this is turning more into an exceptional project. Finding anything uh, around $200,000 in Brantford is very difficult now, especially in this shape. It was, it needed work, but I have seen absolute sh like falling down shacks for more. Gotcha. So, so yeah, this one's a pretty decent deal, but it is pretty typical of a single family home in Brantford. Awesome. Yeah. This magic wall. So he created this wall on wheels. I've never seen that before. <laughs> Me neither. So in behind we have all like the um, furnace and hot water tanks and everything. But this was pretty entertaining when we first bought the house. We thought this was pretty funny. Um, actually, it's all brand new too, which is really nice. It's an expenditure we didn't have to worry about. Um, but yeah, this is definitely kind of one of those like handmade things that it's kind of, kind of exciting. So I don't know if we're gonna keep this, but I mean, I don't know. It works. <laughs> Just paint and put like a handful on it. So, so I'll see if I can find the lights down here. Yeah. So, this space, um, we actually came down and unfortunately discovered a little bit of water damage. So rather than just leave it, we decided to parge the entire like inside, waterproof it, um, and insulate it. Again, we didn't really have to go that extra mile, but we want to make this house like as functional as possible for a family that lives here. So we actually like sealed the floors, painted it. Um, you can tell it's almost like a little more like soundproof in here now too. So you know, it's just like a nice space for a family to come. They can store things down here they could even create like a little rec room essentially um, and we always know that like for the future value of the home that you know we want to increase as much as possible without going too much over budget 
So this isn't the largest layout of like a single family home, being that it is kind of like an old Victorian, open concept really wasn't their thing. So we really tried to make use of the space as best as we could. So hypothetically, this is like a two bedroom house. So what we did is this room over here actually used to be um, uh, like an open foyer type of like area. So we actually closed it in. So now that actually serves as like a master bed. So if there was like an elderly couple that wanted to live here, there's actually a full piece bath on the main level as well. So I think that's probably why they designed it this way. So, you know, we kind of cater to like a lot of different uh, potential like renters that would want to um, come in here and obviously this is the living space we've done all new flooring new drywall paint um, so we're coming along pretty well on this main level these are all of our nice new appliances um, and you can see yeah this is gonna actually make like a pretty nice like open concept master bedroom um, we replaced some of these windows because they were older um, but nice high ceilings good open space again new flooring um, and paint in here we didn't have to do a lot so yeah, this is just one of those kind of creative ways of maximizing the space that you have when, you know, two bedroom houses are really hard to sell. So essentially this way we're kind of providing a bit more value for the tenants, parents can live here or even upstairs and you could even have like a nursery, um, whatever you want essentially. So. Um, and then the main piece bath on the main level. It's kind of interesting. We haven't seen this layout too often, but there's actually a full five piece bath down here um, with the two piece being on the upper level, which is really weird. Um, but again, I think there was maybe like an elderly couple living here beforehand. So it's actually like a huge bathroom and we're not gonna do too much to it. Um, you can see that like there's a nice little jacuzzi tub we're going to be replacing um the shower and it's a really nice functional space essentially um for someone especially if there is like an elderly you know couple that lives here there's a lot of extra like storage space around so yeah, this one's almost coming along um we store a lot of stuff in here because we're not doing a ton of construction in this particular room so and the pedestal sink will be going <laughs> <laughs> They're not super functional, so yeah. So I can show you guys the proper upstairs. Awesome. All right. So you can see this is like actually originally like what the walls look like. It was like this old like plaster. Now there was a lot of debate amongst like our construction crew whether we were going to tear down all of this, but we just knew that it was going to really really ramp up the budget. So we replaced the drywall that really needed to get done, and then for this we actually just plastered and painted over it. So we think it's like kind of a decent solution. It's not in bad shape, and that way we kind of saved a little bit of money there. Same with replacing these steps. We decided not to actually go ahead and do the full like laminate only because stairs are really expensive and if anyone's done like laminate or hardwood on stairs installation is super costly so what we're gonna do is actually just sand these down restain them and then that'll be it I mean it is a rental so you don't want to go too crazy with the budget on that end of things so um, all right let's go upstairs <laughs> Sarah, when it comes to projects like this, do you have a standard, you know, flooring type, standard color palette? How do you approach your flips and your buy and hold investments? That's a good question. Um, I think probably a lot of investors do this. And yes, we do have kind of like a set structure that mm -hmm. we follow just to make life simple. Yeah. I have it now. So like a lot of my contractors are running my flips with me remotely. So um, if I'm not there to tell them, you mm -hmm. know, colors, like I don't want to be wasting my time in Home Depot, uh, yes. picking out tiles, picking all that stuff. I'm over that now. Mm -hmm. It was fun in the beginning, yes. not on my like 50th property. Mm -hmm. So for me now, um, we just kind of go with like the trend right now, which is I have this like nice color that I love. I think it's from Bear. It's like morning mist gray, okay. just a nice pale yeah. gray on the walls, white trim. We just do a plain small white subway tile for a backsplash. Mm -hmm. um, I like quartz countertops actually. Um, I don't put like laminate or uh, engineered in a lot of my places. Okay. I just go for like a nice clean like quartz like a white or something mm -hmm. we have a really good supplier outside of stony creek actually that gives us really good rates um, oh, okay. on our kitchen 
difference. Yeah, yeah, they do really good kind of like wholesale rates on their kitchen products. Um, and I'm just like an IKEA kitchen type of person, or just like the plain white, yeah. you know, nice Basic, and modern. simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we also have a really good um, flooring place out of Hamilton as well. We just go for like either like a brown or gray kind of like distressed uh, vinyl. So mm -hmm. in all of my projects, I think I've put laminate in only a handful of them. But even though vinyl is slightly more expensive, um, it just it holds up so much better on yeah. our rentals. And for the flips even, I find it looks nice. And some people like the idea that their kids can drop yes. objects or you know juice or something on the ground and it's not mm -hmm. going to ruin their laminate. So. Yeah, vinyl's just so much more resilient, right, yes. than yeah. uh, laminate flooring. So I've been noticing that more and more often a lot of investors that even, you know, five, ten years ago were using uh, laminate now are transitioning just because vinyl's becoming so much more competitive. Yeah, it used to be so expensive, nobody wanted to buy it. And now they have some really high-end mm -hmm. uh, vinyl products that look, they have that like sheen on them that look just like yeah. high-end laminate, so yeah. We also like kind of like preserving the character of the house too. I mean, clearly there's a lot of character in this house and you know, maintaining some of the original woodwork, I usually try to keep some of the existing house in. So this is one of the upstairs bedrooms. For an older house, it's actually a really good size. So um, you can see there's already like a pretty nice deep like built-in closet so we didn't have to add closets. Two really nice big windows. They were already replaced. So we didn't have to worry about that. Um, and this flooring was actually in here too. So we're not really doing much with these upstairs bedrooms at all. We put in some new doors going to kind of clean up the trim work and things like that just as a cosmetic upgrade but for the most part these rooms upstairs were actually really good it was the main level that needed the most amount of work um, definitely like odd shaped ceilings that's pretty typical in houses like this so this other bedroom fairly similar um, slightly smaller but still nice all the rooms in this house have really high ceilings which is really nice have a nice little closet in the back here and again nice big windows which again I think we're placing that window because it won't open so yeah otherwise the one of the most interesting parts is the bathroom upstairs it's really bizarre the way they um, set it up we're not really sure 100% what's underneath this so we're just not going to really remove it you can see <laughs> we kept some of their like original decor which is pretty exciting this like fake brick wallpaper and they have this like random little built-in like cabinet like in the corner here um as much as it's not aesthetically the most pleasing thing in the world we're actually going to keep it mostly because we're pretty sure that under here there's stuff that we don't want to get into when we start to move it we, it's probably like a piece of the stack um and like plumbing so rather than get into a whole bunch of stuff we again it's a rental we want to do as much renovations as necessary to increase the value but we don't ever want to overspend in a rental like this so sure you know is this built-in cabinet really pretty no but it does serve a function and a purpose especially for like a powder room so we're just going to replace the vanity um kind of replace some of this chipped up tile over here and i'll probably just paint this like a nice white and i don't know the tenants might actually enjoy having a bit of built-in storage space in the long run so yeah so really all that's left um, is to do the kitchen installation um, some trim and finishing work around most of the house but for the most part we are probably two weeks away from completion earlier in the video Sarah you mentioned something that I'm sure some of the more astute uh, listeners heard a hundred percent loan to value with your private financing yeah. one is that even possible and two if so how, how does that work it is definitely possible. I've done it on more properties than you would imagine. Um, really, the only secret I can say is be um, like negotiate with your broker. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, my I either do it two way, one of two ways. It's either through my mortgage broker or it's just like individuals that yeah. are loaning me money. This particular one was actually even through a broker, oh, okay. um, but it's just a broker I have a really good rapport with. She mm -hmm. kind of went off the books a little bit to find me like an individual that was willing to kind of not go through the normal channels essentially. Okay. Um, and because of like our good credit and the other projects that we've done and the experience that we have, mm -hmm. they were willing to go 100% loan to value. Mostly I'm thinking too, because it was only like a $210,000 yeah. property, you know, the risk is a little, mm -hmm. little less for a lot of lenders, but 
even my other private lenders that I find on my own, they'll often go 100% loan to value if I'm, you know, have a bit of skin in the game if I'm providing like the renovation funds, okay. for example. Um, but don't be afraid to ask. Yeah. You know, my broker might come to me and say, I'll only give you 65% loan to value. I'm like, no, not a chance. Like, I'm not putting down that much. How about this and this and this? And sometimes we make concessions on mm -hmm. interest rates. I probably. Right pay higher interest rates, mm -hmm. like I pay 10%. Um, and people are like, oh, that's so high. But that's the cost of doing business money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, at 100% loan to value, that means nothing out of my pocket and just some interest fees. Yeah. So I'm willing to pay it just for the ease of having my entire property. Okay. So 10% interest. And then is there like an origination fee or a setup fee that you're also paying? Um, it all depends on the lender. They can sometimes go as high as like 3% lending mm -hmm. fees. Most of mine are about a 1% lender fee. If it's a broker, usually a 1% broker fee. Yeah. And then we always pay for the lawyer fees for the setup of the actual right. documentation. And again, that's just a matter of like building it into your spreadsheets, making sure your numbers work. And if the numbers work, why wouldn't you say yes to that? opportunity exactly I as you know we talked about before with like my sheet I mean I factor all of that into like holding costs all of those extra costs of business that I'm going to incur before I take on a project so yeah okay so lesson number one guys a hundred percent loan to value is possible but at the same time it's very relationship oriented so the first time you walk in off the street you're probably not going to get that hundred percent loan to value especially if you don't have a history and a track record to show that uh, mortgage broker that hey you actually know what you're doing you're a sophisticated business person that you know you're strategic investors so exactly. at the start of 2016 four years ago I literally was a ghost on social media. Back in 2016, no one knew who I was. No one other than maybe my parents and best friends knew I was a real estate investor. In my real estate business now, I legit only sell on social media. I do not sell anything else. I don't care about a sign. I don't print off any pieces of paper and hand it to you. Only social media. I've built my entire real estate agent business off social media. Over the course of one single Instagram live video where I was walking through a property, I was actually able to raise $80,000. Today, four to 5,000 people watch me every single day on YouTube. A thousand people will watch my stories on Instagram. You know, over 500 will watch my stories on Facebook. I just envision that as how could I possibly talk to 5,000 people a day one on one? People lend me money for my real estate investments. If you didn't know, myself and Matt McKeever are in the apartment buying business right now and we're buying a lot of units. So people lend us money for renovations, for deposits, and we pay interest on that. And I often share the interest of payments on Instagram, which leads to more people reaching out to me wondering how they can get involved. And because of that, I was able to raise almost a million dollars within the last 90 days. Basically taking this business from zero to now we've done over $1.4 million in sales this year and it's all been through social media. I've been actually able to attract all six of my top performing wholesalers and my back of house staff through social media, okay? All of it has been done through there and by showing the process. The printing press, tele and radio communications, the internet, and then social media. These are the four big media revolutions that just changed the game as we know it. And right now, I'm in a giant land grab to try and get my hands on as much of the social media attention world as possible. If you guys are not on social media, you have to do it. I don't care if you're a restaurant, you're an insurance agent, you're a real estate agent, you need to be on social media. It's the easiest way to branch out and talk to so many people. If there was only one thing I could tell you guys, the one thing I would tell you is start today. Okay, yesterday was the best time to start. In fact, when you first even thought about your business idea, that was the best time to start. But the next best time is right now. If you start posting and start publishing your story today, I guarantee you, you will have results from social media so long as you stay consistent. So come and get your social proof. Right, so now Sarah's going to break down for us another investment she's doing in Brantford, Ontario. This one's a fiveplex, right? Yep. So Sarah's written down the numbers for, oh, wait, this is the wrong deal. There we go. This is the right deal. 
Beautiful. So, you've broken down for us here, Sarah. This is the five plex that we've been seeing on social media a bit, right? Yeah, my baby. <laughs> so, was this another private deal? It was, yeah. It actually, so my business partner, he owns the triplex next door. Oh, okay. And when they were doing construction on it, the landlord actually saw them doing work on it and was like, hey, why don't you come in and make us an offer? So, we managed to get a deal done. I love that. We always use that as an opportunity, too, when we're in the neighborhood anyways, right? To take a look around and often, Thanks. if you're going to be fixing up this property if say this is the next worst property on the street you can get a lot of lift for your original property just by owning and controlling this one absolutely yeah so this one we weren't able to do hundred percent LTV though unfortunately not uh, the reason we didn't do hundred uh, percent loan to value is I have a JV partner on this one holding the mortgage and he works with a really creative credit union and while they only gave us 65 percent loan to value they already pre-approved him to refinance it into an 80 percent loan to value product once it's completed. So it's so simple. We're with the same financial institution. He doesn't have to break a mortgage, pay all these extra fees to go to a different lending institution or with mm -hmm. a private mortgage. So yeah, it was actually pretty easy because technically that's a 65%, not private mortgage, but an actual like yeah. conventional mortgage with a credit union. So, mm -hmm. so essentially your total uh, down payment then $98,000. Yeah. You've broken down your closing costs again. So again, this is just legal, land transfer tax, all that. Renovations of one 70. So this is going to be a big project. Yeah. So and, what's that include? Oh yeah. So this is a really, really big one. Uh, and 170, the squiggle for like okay. maybe there is because it might even get a little closer to 200. Mm -hmm. Obviously, because this is in the downtown area of Brantford, we do not want to over improve this property. It's intended on being used as a multi, but for students. So we're going to do as much as we need to do to get it safe, to get it up to code, um, but obviously not go too, too yeah. crazy like we would maybe in Hamilton. So this property, um, um, we've already started a little bit on the exterior work. Why we're not inside today is because my tenants are still here. So we're gonna have to uh, wait a little bit before we can do like a interior walkthrough, but it's going to include a substantial amount of electrical updating, a ton of plumbing work. We've already quoted those out. It's gonna be almost like 30, 40 grand just for that alone. Oh, okay. There's some knob and tube, you know, it's an older yeah. building, uh, totally new roof, all new, um, windows it's also going to include all the cosmetic finishes so we haven't even talked about flooring paint yeah. new kitchens new bathrooms and they are going to be brand new bathrooms and kitchens and flooring and you need it's five of them five of them in every single unit yeah. so we're definitely talking some some substantial renos we're even talking we're working with our architect right now about bumping out the loft oh, nice. because it's very short up there and we can't even get like upper cabinets so we're actually debating what it's going to cost us to actually raise the roof and add a little more ceiling height. So. And seeing how you're looking at a roof replacement anyways, this is the time to do it. Exactly. Gotcha. And then again, we've got holding costs here. Yep. So this is just going to be our utilities and property taxes. Yep. And uh, mortgage payments and everything in there. So. Okay. And then, so our all-in total cash cost about just under $300,000. Yeah. So how's this compared to projects you've done in the past? Is this one of the bigger projects? Is this a medium project? I would say from the amount of of uh, capital we're putting into it, definitely one of like the larger existing renos. We've done some more like development, like start from scratch type of projects, which are almost easier, I'll have to yeah. admit, because you're starting with a blank canvas. The fact that we're going in and we don't know what's in behind the walls, this is definitely from a renovation standpoint like that, one of the bigger ones we've ever done. Um, but I mean, it was at such an amazing discount, we're willing yeah. to take the risk, so. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, so target refinance, 530000 Yep. Uh, now, the story behind that is we're actually going to do something a little unique. So this is a legal fourplex, non-conforming five. It was retrofitted in 1994. This main level was broken up into two oh, okay. units. We are actually doing something which you might sound crazy to most people, and we're actually reducing it down to a fourplex. The reason is because the bachelor unit in the back is so non-functional, the way the layout is, I actually think it's a detriment to the value oh, of the okay. building. So by breaking up, we've already got permission from the city we're getting the permits to tear down the wall in between those two main level units and to make it into one. Two reasons behind that. Number one, it's going to be a student rental. So this way we can fit more beds in like right. an open concept way. It'll be like a kind of like a large suite, which will be really nice. Um, but two, also the fact that you're just not going to attract like great tenants into a bachelor mm -hmm. unit like that. And I mean, really like it's, there's like a galley kitchen, a hallway, and that's about like your whole space for the unit. Yeah. So in this case, we're actually, I think going to do better by kind of deconstruction 
construct deconstructing it and turning it back into a fourplex. Okay. And so was it hard to find, say, comps? Or like how do you go about determining just because this is such a big project where you're going to land on your ARV? Yeah, I mean, there has never been a project of this scope and caliber in this downtown area oh, okay. of Brantford uh, for a fourplex. Yeah. So this is basically based on surrounding neighborhoods and this is the low end. So there are similar Victorian style fourplexes that have been fully renovated, sold on market for between that five to 530. We're hoping that by the time we're done next spring, it might actually be worth more. We're seeing purpose-built fourplexes coming on the market now close to the 700 range. Okay. So we're hoping to actually like break a record in the yeah. neighborhood for these like non-purpose builts and kind of like up the up the value. I love it. Yeah. So then essentially if we're able to hit this 530 at an 80% loan to value, you're going to be left with about 40,000 tied into the project. Yep. Yeah. And then so cash flow. This is actually looking like fantastic cash flow. Yeah. That's why we decided. So um, this is where you really need to like know your markets because if I were just to rent these units out to locals and just like long-term rentals, um, our cash flow would not be quite as exciting. We are in a gentrifying neighborhood in Brantford. It's downtown, not ideal for families, and that's who I tend to like to rent to. However, we're I think a less than a six-minute walk from Laurier oh, campus. Oh wow, that's great. So we're thinking uh, this next door is actually a student rental as well. So and we share parking so we were figuring you know what if we kind of like combine forces yeah. we have a little bit of shared parking here um, by renting out per bed and to you know a group of friends we're really really maxing out our cash flow nice I love it this is yeah. fantastic from a cash on cash perspective Absolutely. and so obviously great ROI based off of that yeah. a anything else we should know about this project um, um, I would say this project is definitely not for the faint of heart. You know, uh, we did as much due diligence as we could when we first did it. Um, but you know, the other thing is it's fully tenanted. So we've really been um, working with the tenants. They understand what's happening. We filed uh, N13s because we're doing con like considerable Massive. construction yeah. to the actual integrity of the building. Meaning, you know, they are going to have to to leave, but we're doing it through the proper channels. We've spoken with them. And I think this is something a lot of people maybe don't talk about when you're buying, mm -hmm. you know, fully tenanted buildings like this. It's not as easy as just coming in, yeah. cool, let's renovate the building. You know, we have to work with the people that have made this their home. Um, and we want to try to do good by everybody. So we're in Bramford today and it is honestly one of my favorite cities ever to invest in. It's where I got started and it's where I'm definitely going to continue to grow my portfolio. A lot of people are on the fence about Bramford because it is definitely a gentrifying market, but there's so many benefits to investing in this city. Uh, year over year, it's been appreciating over 15%, probably even closer to 30% if you kind of go off of the records off of MLS. Um, we're just seeing almost like a 0% vacancy rate here and even better is the investment that the city is making in the actual town of Brantford. So they are opening up all the different zoning to allow us to densify and do multiplex conversions. They're opening up even commercially zoned properties to build more residential. So with the support of the city, they're bringing in even more industries here. They're bringing in a ton of uh, big box stores. They're really making Brantford its own nucleus so that they don't have to rely so heavily on the growth in Hamilton. So, I mean, we're almost actually on par with Hamilton rental rates today, and we're seeing price inflation come up even closer to where it is in Hamilton now. So it's a really untapped market, uh, and we're going to take advantage of that as much as we can before anyone else figures out that this is the new hotspot. All right, guys, so that's wrapping up my Brantford 5plex. If you guys want to follow along on this awesome journey, you can follow me on YouTube or Instagram at Sarah Etter Invest. Hey, YouTube. Did you know that I've got an education company? I'm going to guess you didn't because a lot of you guys DM me asking if I do. So it's called Cashflow Tribe. You can go to www.cashflowtribe.com, check it out. You can sign up for a completely free membership. There's also is a premium membership that has all kinds of great features you can unlock, but just go check out the free membership. You've got a calculator you can use online completely free. You've got Canada's most robust online forums for real estate investors, and you've got some great resources and some free, completely free courses that you can get and all you need to do is sign up for your free membership. It's an amazing network of Canadian real estate investors, and I hope you guys go grab your free membership today.
Thank you so much, Sarah, for sitting down and taking the time to do this interview. So I'd love to just kind of dive into your backstory. When did you get into real estate investing? What piqued your interest? How did this all come together? Um, I love telling this story about like how I got started because it's so unique. Um, I was a business graduate. Mm -hmm. I graduated from university, took off to Europe for a year and decided to travel the world. Nice. Uh, came back, started my own business that wasn't, I don't want to say an epic failure because that would be like a disservice to myself, <laughs> but it wasn't like the greatest experience ever. I was mm -hmm. so new to business. I didn't have a lot of people helping me and I really like got myself into some big problems. Like I was in debt. I was overfaced. I didn't hire staff soon enough. Like I really just didn't right. understand how to scale mm -hmm. a business. And so because of that, I found myself, I think I was 25 or 26 and I was stuck. Like I did not see a way forward with this business. Mm -hmm. I was so deep in debt and I thought, okay, I'm going to have to do something. But it broke my heart to let go of this company. Like I poured my blood, sweat, and tears, yeah. right? It was my dream since I was like a little kid. So I ended up saying, okay, I'm going to get my feet wet back in the corporate world. I have a mm -hmm. business degree. Let's just see if I can get some admin work, see if I can struggle through this. So I was on Indeed and I'm scrolling through all this like information and I came across uh, an ad. It was a contract position, flexible hours, hourly rates. I was like, okay, I can, I can stomach this for 10 hours a yeah. week. See if I like it and it was a property management company oh, okay and at first I didn't care that it was real estate it could have been like for yeah. like a medical like office like I didn't really care um, so I'm in this role and I'm thinking oh like this is kind of fun like I'm dealing with tenants and dealing with like paperwork and I thought it, the numbers were really interesting mm -hmm. and my particular company also did joint ventures oh, so okay. of course that was way outside my scope yeah. I, at first I'm like I don't even know anything about real estate and what is a joint venture um, he's like oh we buy properties using other people's money and we invest and and manage properties, which mm -hmm. I thought was a really, yeah. really cool uh, idea. And then, you know, so he actually started to mentor me. And we would sit after work and he would pull out a whiteboard and he'd be like, okay, this is how you calculate cash flow. Oh, cool. This is like, he really like taught me because he's like, if you're going to be in my office, you mm -hmm. need to understand yeah. what we're doing. And I was like, what's cash flow? I don't understand. You know, like refinancing appreciation. Mm -hmm. I have no idea of all the lingo. So he, he taught me a bit and I really dove into it. I remember coming home and talking to my partner and I'm just so excited. I'm like, this could change our lives. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, this is just like, it's real estate. Don't get so excited. And then finally my boss took me to a rain meeting mm -hmm. and that's when I'll never forget that day because I sat in a room of 400 full-time investors making such good money and like literally changing like their futures mm -hmm. through real estate and I was like until then I didn't think real estate was a profession like unless right. you were a realtor or a property manager I, I'm like an investor that's not a real job mm -hmm. and then I saw that it really was and that's when everything changed I was like you know what this is what I want to do for the rest of my life and then so how did you make the leap from kind of the information gathering, the learning process into actually like getting a property? Yeah, so that was a really scary leap. Um, at that point, I mean, I was still making like hourly salary, you know, like I was still in debt. I was really just still trying to figure out the whole real estate game. Um, but I was like, you know what? I was a salesperson in my earlier life. Okay. Um, I, so I was actually an equestrian. So I was a professional athlete and I sold high level horses, like horses worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. And a lot of my clients were like millionaires and like yeah. even billionaires. Ultra wealthy. Yeah. So I am no stranger to money. Mm -hmm. Like, like a lot of people, I think they get nervous doing their first JD yeah, deal, absolutely. right? It's like, oh my God, I have to ask for a hundred thousand dollars. And I'm like, I've seen like, I've, you know, been flown around in like private helicopters for some of my clients before. So for me, I was like, I'm confident. I think enough talking mm -hmm. to wealthy people that once I get the education that I need, I'm just going to go for it. And so I just got really educated, kept going to rain meetings, learned how joint ventures worked. Um, mm -hmm start to pick markets. I picked Brantford after doing yeah. some research. I followed like, you know, the rain has like a scorecard and oh, you, know, right. you pick yeah. your markets based mm -hmm. on like demographics. I thought, okay, you know, Brantford seems like a good place to start. And I started, I think initially advertising on Kijiji and I was like scouring for private deals, mm -hmm. like, you know, for sale yep. by owners, stuff like that. And I ended up meeting a local guy who had a student rental for sale. And I ended up buying into that deal with sweat equity because he was liquidating his student rental portfolio. 
he didn't want to manage it. He wanted to go here. He has like a sailboat in Florida where he oh, spent okay. the winter. And I said, okay, I will take on the project and I will manage it for you for like a cut of equity. Interesting. That's a really unique proposition there. Yeah. He wanted me to put down cash. Like I think mm-hmm. it was like $30,000. And at the time, like I was really new. I didn't have any private lenders yet. And I thought, okay, maybe I'll talk to some of my family, see if someone has 30,000 I can borrow. But um, then I thought, okay, you know what? Let's do a JV. I shouldn't have to put any money down. I earn my keep by doing the hard sweat equity. So I was like, hey, how do you feel about, you know, me taking on, you know, the property management? I'll do X, Y, and Z while you're gone. And, you know, we'll go from there. And he agreed, so. And so let's break down for the audience. Thank you, YouTube, for 50,000 subscribers. It's been an amazing journey. And thank you to the team for this vegan cake. This is epic, guys. Just absolutely love it. I'm speechless. Again, thank you to all of you that have been on the journey for the last two and a half years now on YouTube. 50,000 subs. I can remember when I originally started my YouTube channel dreaming about 10,000 subs dreaming about a thousand subs and i can even remember talking to one of my best friends at the time and being like 200 subs would be cool man so 50,000, amazing we're still just halfway to a hundred thousand though so we got a lot more to do and a lot more to go we'll do x y and z while you're gone and you know we'll go from there and he agreed so and so let's break down for the audience what does that sweat equity look like like is that managing the property is it finding tenants what exactly were you doing what was the day-to-day there um he was pretty much like a traditional jv in the sense that he was a hundred percent hands off so okay. the mortgage still in his name he was still kind of dealing with paying some of the utilities and all of that but i was responsible for maintenance dealing with the tenants finding tenants mm-hmm. anything you know going on with the property in general was all on me especially when he was gone in florida if something needed done you know shoveling and all that stuff yeah. I, that was on me so okay yeah and then so once you kind of got your foot in the door with this first this was one property right at first yeah. Then how did your like real estate investing career evolve after that? It was still a little bumpy because I was so like at that point I was full time at the property management company um, and I was figuring out a way like how to scale. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting training from some different people on like how to raise more capital. And so I was trying out so many different tactics, some which worked and some which didn't, you know, the whole like you approach your friends and family and your colleagues. My family was not on board. They were like, we don't understand what you're doing at all. Um, And so it, it was a little like touch and go for like the mm-hmm. first year, I'd say, as I started to figure things out. Um, and it doesn't help when you don't have capital of your own. Mm-hmm. You know, I was really trying to find those like VTB deals yep. so I wouldn't have to put in any cash. Um, back then, I don't think I knew enough about how to find good off market properties. Like right. I was going about it the wrong way. So I did a few more deals that year, uh, one with like a family friend, so kind of people within my existing circle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, Um, that's when I started to get a little more educated. I actually started to talk to some wholesalers right? and see how they were marketing. And I was like, Oh, like I've been doing this like the wrong way, like this whole time. So I got way better at finding off market properties. Once that happened and then I started leveraging social media, that's when things like really took off. Then I feel like I had more of like a product, like something of value to give back to my okay. DVs. Yeah. yeah, it was like, okay, now I have these off-market deals. Mm-hmm. You know, under market value, opportunity to increase rents, we can flip it, we can burr it. Then all of a sudden people were starting to kind of knock on the door and say, hey, like I want in on that, mm-hmm. that deal. So I kind of kind of ha- reverse hacked the the system a bit and figured out what my JVs wanted, promoted it on social media, and then you know, I had a lot more people coming to me. I love it. So essentially to summarize, you know, you had lots of time and you're gaining experience and knowledge, but still needed the money, the capital to actually execute on the deals. So you kind of built a JV avatar of someone that wants to be truly hands off, like your first uh, JV partner was, and then really just relentlessly targeted them and made it happen. Exactly. And I have a marketing background, so I'm, I feel like I'm pretty good at like writing and Mm -hmm. using social media. So yeah, I just like went crazy. I was like, all right, this is my avatar. I started a YouTube channel. I started going on Instagram. I, you know, created an entire brand around yeah. finding joint venture partners and it worked. 
Yeah, and so this is something you're really well known for now, like in the Ontario real estate community, yes. right? Yeah. So any tips that you could share with the audience, maybe some quick social media tips or marketing tips as far, I know there's a lot of viewers that they aspire to do essentially exactly what you've done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would say um, I do a lot of talks about this actually, like specifically around social media, because I feel like um, the way we were taught like 20 years ago mm -hmm. to do find JV partners, their snail mail, and posting like newsletters like physical right, like yeah. letters and I'm like no that's not the mm -hmm. way it works anymore people don't have time for that so I think when it comes to social media um, it really just comes down to branding in general like you can post all you want on social media but if you don't have a recognizable brand if you don't have something that people want to be a part of you can post all day long and no one is gonna reach out to you. So it's important to know who you're talking to, create a brand that's unique, whether it's the market you invest in or the properties you invest in, you really have to like showcase that, let your personality come through so that people get excited about the idea of working with you. The posting, that becomes easier as you go along. You learn how to post on Facebook, you learn how to use Instagram stories, you can Google all that and learn YouTube videos like about how to do it. But I think the actual branding is the toughest part and I think that's what needs to come first before people start trying to attract JVs on social. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know a lot of you know beginner investors, once they start getting on social media, I find far too often they're trying to be perfect or get yes. fancy with it yeah. rather than just posting. And to me, it's all just about creating initial awareness and attention, and then eventually we can start honing that in on our funnel. But at the start, it literally just starts by posting. I agree. People get away from the consistency by trying to, mm -hmm. you know, do all this different stuff and they're so technical and yeah. getting into it. I show hilarious videos. I'm like, look at this really gross bat I found in the basement of my new rental. Or like oftentimes I'm without makeup and it's just like in the moment. But I think that really resonates with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for context, where are you now on your real estate investing journey? Are you still working full time? What's that look like? So I'm actually just coming up on the one year anniversary of me quitting my full-time job. So I've been a full time. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's still kind of sinking in that this is like my full-time career yeah. now. Um, because I'm still still building, still growing, learning, and you know, making mistakes along the way, mm -hmm. which I think is normal and that's absolutely part of the process, especially when mm -hmm. working with JVs. Um, so yeah, this year worked out so good. Like when I got to focus all of my attention on just finding properties and just finding JVs, yeah. I was just able to scale so fast and all the things that felt so hard before I really weren't that difficult I just never had the time mm -hmm. you know I had a full-time job I was responsible for so um, yeah so now we are getting more and more away from the smaller residential into like larger commercial buildings um, this year I finally hit 45 doors which That's is awesome amazing That's crazy. yeah Cause, again for perspective you've been doing this for <laughs> it'll be almost like three years now. yeah so three years 45 doors that's that's truly awesome yeah and it just keeps like accelerating mm -hmm. I, I always tell people when they're first getting started like your first or second deal is yeah. so hard like you feel like you don't know how you're gonna do it mm -hmm. and then once that happens it's like you know it's a snowball effect the more JV deals I do the more successful they are the more people keep reaching out to me I yeah. get featured on more like YouTube channels and I do <laughs> things like this and it just keeps like you know growing and growing without me I feel like I don't have to work as hard anymore to find JVs. I'd say the majority of my time now is finding good opportunities to keep up with the demand yeah. <laughs> that people are looking for. And so we're really just starting to look into building our own multis and doing land development and commercial developments because there's just not enough good deals for my partners I find um, on MLS. So yeah. we're definitely taking that step into developing now. So. Awesome, I love it. So I'm sure there's a lot of viewers that are inspired by this. Mm -hmm. If you could kind of go back in time and give advice to yourself, you know, three, five years ago, yeah. I'm sure they would love to hear it because I know there's a lot of business grads watching this now, a lot of business students, a lot of people that just aren't sure how to really break into real estate. 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, looking back, I think um, fear really held me back. Mm -hmm. Like I had like the imposter syndrome. Like I was young, I was like 27 and thinking, oh, like I'm gonna ask these people for money. I don't even own my own principal residence. And I didn't have a mentor. And I think that was also like a big mistake was I just tried to pull all the learning together and like make all those mistakes as I went along. And I was able to do it, but I really wished that like in the beginning I had just like invested in a really good mentor that pushed me through those mental blocks that showed me exactly like what I had to do because I feel like I wouldn't have made so many mistakes earlier on like trying to find all those off-market deals that took yeah. me a whole year to get a handle on and I feel like if I had actually got advice sooner mm -hmm. I really would have like accelerated my my growth and so I think there's the power of knowledge and your network and getting you know education from people that have done it before us mm -hmm. it it's worth every penny essentially yeah. so yeah yeah i honestly believe that the school of hard knocks is one of the most expensive teachers it's definitely how i went through it and i understand why a lot of real estate investors feel that way because at the same time there is a lot of like fly by night gurus and you know cash grab seminars but if you can really find someone that's actually doing what you want to do in your local market that's such a valuable skill set to be able to just like get from a mentor rather than try and reinvent the wheel yourself absolutely well thanks again sarah if people want to reach out, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Um, so my brand is Sarah Etter Invest. So that's my handle across um, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And my website is sarahetter.com. Thanks again to Sarah Etter and everyone that's ever came on my YouTube channel for making these videos, creating this amazing content and allowing us just to level up as Canadian real estate investors. If you guys enjoyed this video, smash that like button, hit the subscribe button if you're new to my channel. And again, let me know in the comment section who else should I be making a compilation video with?